This past weekend, I won the SCG Modern 10K held in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm going to tell you how I did it and why I left disappointed. As many of you probably already know, I chose Black Green Yawgmoth as my deck of choice. This is the deck that I am known for. Despite the fact that my YouTube channel features a bunch of different brews and weird decks, this is the deck I have thousands of reps with. This list is what I call Yawgmoth version 2.6. This iteration of the deck is one that I've tweaked and tuned over time. You can find a sideboard guide for this list on my Patreon. I'm not going to cover every card individually, but I'll talk through some of the notable changes that I've made to the list recently and how I arrived at those choices. First and foremost, when you're looking at this list, you'll notice six fetch lands. This has changed from five. I went up to six, mostly because of the presence of underground mortuary. Additionally, a lot of Yawgmoth lists tend to run Takanuma. I chose to cut Takanuma from my list for this event in favor of nurturing Peatland just because I like the consistency that black green lands provide in this deck over mono black lands. I found that I was getting punished for having Takanuma in the list more often than I would like, so it got sent back to the Yogg toolbox. The rest of the main deck is very similar to what I've been running. The biggest change as of recently is that I've shaved down to three Bowmasters in order to move one of my utility creatures from the sideboard into the main deck to make room for an additional sideboard card. Those utility creatures include Scavenging Ooze, Haywire Might, Hapatra, Shieldred, and Endurance. A lot of people are not playing Shieldred right now. They say that it's not as good as it once was, and I would agree with that, but I still want access to it in my 75. It's a great way to gain life. It also synergizes with the deck's main combo engine. Uh, and over the course of the weekend, as you're about to see, it actually performed very, very well, and I was very happy to have it in the list. Moving on to the sideboard, some notable cards include Surgical Extraction, very good in the mirror match, also good against the graveyard decks that are prominent in the metagame. Despite the fact I didn't really face too many of those, Surgical still played a key part of my victory this weekend. I mentioned earlier that I cut an Orcish Bowmasters from my list to make room for an additional utility creature. The reason I did that is because I wanted to play two Fulminator Mages in the list, uh, so that was the concession in order to do that. Also played two Pick Your Poison, was just probably the most versatile sideboard card that we have access to in the color green. As of now, it's in every deck that plays green. And the big reason to play this card is for the domain matchup, which you'll see I played quite a few times over the course of the weekend. Additionally, Reclamation Sage gives me an out to the card Cursed Totem. Shieldred's Edict gives me an out to a Scion of Draco if there's a Leyline of the Guild Pack in play. And rounding out the sideboard, I have two Fatal Push, two Thawseys, and two Force of Vigors which are fairly stock in Yawgmoth list these days. Jumping into the main event, I had put up a pretty good performance the day before in the modern 5k. I lost a winning in for top eight against Mason Clark, who wound up winning the event. And I told Mason after I lost to him that I was a little bit disappointed, not only because I lost my shot at a top eight berth in that tournament, but because my goal for the weekend was to win all three modern events that were being held. And he laughed and he said, it was, you know, that's a lofty goal. And that might sound crazy. And I don't know that that's ever been done before, but that was the standard that I held myself to for this weekend. And I fully believed, and I still believe that I could do it under the right circumstances. So with that being the bar that I set for myself, let's jump into the main event and talk through the matchups. I sit down round one against Owen, who is a younger gentleman, probably in his early twenties. And he was very stoic, very unemotional over the course of our match. When I'm playing in big events, I always am very serious about winning. I'm always very serious about adhering to the rules of the game and playing my best. And I will get very frustrated with myself if I make mistakes or if I lose, but I always try to be cordial to my opponents and I always try to make light of the situation if it's tense or I, I try to have a good time in the midst of trying to win. Owen was very clearly all business. And over the course of our match, I was cracking jokes, trying to get him to laugh, trying to get him to crack a smile. And at no point did he break character. He was just even keel focused the entire time we were playing. Owen was piloting Amulet Titan, which I would generally consider to be a favorable matchup for Black Green Yawgmoth. The only problem is Amulet Titan is an extremely explosive deck. In game one, Yawgmoth can struggle to slow them down and oftentimes will lose the first game of the match, especially if I'm on the draw. But fortunately, I was on the play and my opening hand had my main deck Haywire Might, which came in handy to nab his turn one Amulet of Vigor, which bought me a ton of time. I was able to establish Yawgmoth plus Hapatra Vizier of Poisons in play, 
which is basically the kryptonite for their deck. They can't actually establish the creatures that they want to because I can just machine gun them down as soon as they hit the battlefield. So I was able to lock up the game one win, which is the hardest game to win against him on the play. Game two was a slightly different story though, as I had to mulligan down to five cards. And generally in this matchup, I will mulligan fairly aggressively because I am looking for very specific hate cards, Force of Vigor, Pick Your Poison, Haywire Might, things like that, Fulminator Mage. And unfortunately, none of the three hands that I looked at over the course of mulliganing had any of those cards, so I promptly got run over. But fortunately, there was a game three. In game three, I got to establish what is the most satisfying combination of cards that one can have when playing against Amulet Titan, and that is Agatha's Soul Cauldron and Fulminator Mage. I established that combination probably on turn three or turn four after slowing him down with a Force of Vigor and a Pick Your Poison. Between all of those pieces of hate pointed in his direction, he was not able to recover. And eventually I came out on top after blowing up a couple of his lands, landing a Yawgmoth, and just starting to beat him down. I could tell Owen was a little bit disappointed. I think he was a pretty good player and it never feels good to get a round one loss in a tournament. But I will say later in the day, I wanna say around round five or six, I was at the top tables and Owen was sitting right next to me. So what wound up happening is he won every match from that point forward up until like round seven to put himself in a position to potentially top eight. So Owen did a great job. I don't know where Owen finished out for the weekend, but he clearly put a streak together uh, to recover from the round one loss that I inflicted upon him. Round two, I sat across from Phillips and Phillips was a super nice guy who I really enjoyed playing against until I realized what he was playing. Game one, I was on the play and I look at my opening seven cards and I see six spells in a basic swamp. And for anyone that's played Yawgmoth, even if you haven't played Yawgmoth, it is a base green deck. You need forests or green sources in your opening hand to be able to function appropriately. Because my opening hand did not have any of said forests, I had to ship the hand back and look for a better six card hand. I look at my six card hand and it is six spells and a basic swamp. And I was like, WDF, what the heck? Once again, I had to ship the hand back and look for a five card hand. And finally, my five card hand had lands and spells. I believe it was Young Wolf, two lands, Shieldred, and a Wall of Roots. I was a little flustered and a bit frustrated by the first two hands that I had. So I played out an Overgrown Tomb tapped and passed the turn instead of playing out my Young Wolf. And Phillips, on his turn one, decides to play a Grief with a Not Dead After All and takes what was now my four card hand and makes it a two card hand. So I'm stuck with Shieldred and another land. Probably should have scooped up without letting him see what I was actually playing, but he had already seen my land, so it was probably too late at that point. Uh, ultimately, I got completely destroyed that game. Uh, it was not even close, so we move on to game two. Game two, unfortunately able to keep a really good seven card hand that had Ramp, it had Grist, it had Agatha's Soul Cauldron. So kind of the components that you would want when you're fighting against Scam. Phillips starts off with a turn one Thoughtseize and sees that I have Agatha's Soul Cauldron and have a Grist in my hand. The only catch or the problem is my cards are in Japanese. So if somebody is not intimately familiar with what my deck does or what the cards are, they might make a mistake based upon the fact that they can't read my cards. I always will reassure my opponents and tell them, say, hey, if you need to look up any of the cards, please do. I asked the judges if my opponents could use their phones over the course of our match to look up cards. They all said yes. So I assured Phillips that if you need to look up any of these cards, please do so. I don't want you to make mistakes on the account that you can't read them here and now. He assured me he knew what the cards did uh, and proceeded to take Grist the Hunger Tide out of my hand instead of the Agatha's Soul Cauldron that was in my hand. And if you've played with or against that combination of cards, you know how powerful they can be together. So on my next turn, I play out my Agatha Soul Cauldron, eat my Grist, bestow Grist's ability onto my creature in play, and proceed to promptly take over the game with insect tokens. That game was not close. I would say Phillips made a mistake there. Uh, and I would like to think that it was not a byproduct of my cards being in Japanese. He did state that he knew what the cards did. So that was that. Game three, it seemed to me that Phillips boarded in a way where his deck was all removal and no threats. And over the course of the game, I don't know that he actually cast any creatures. It was basically, I would play a creature, he would remove it. I'd play a creature, he would remove it until eventually I found a Grist and I think a Yawgmoth. 
And at that point, I was just able to turn so much card advantage, he was not able to keep up with those threats. And I promptly dispatched of him, despite him being a good guy. Uh, that is what we do to scammers, so don't scam. So we're on to round three, we're two and zero at this point, and I sit across from Nicholas, we're towards the top tables at this point. I wanna say table 11 or 12. Nicholas sits down, he's got a very cheery disposition, very nice guy, we strike up some conversation before the match. Nicholas, who won the die roll, proceeds to start with a Blooming Marsh into a Young Wolf. And I pause in this moment, and I always think to myself, if he's playing Yogmon, does he know who I am? Did he know what he was playing against before we sat down for the match? And that's not me tooting my own horn. Maybe it's a little bit of paranoia, but I, I've established quite a following with regards to this deck over the course of the last couple of years. So I think there is a good number of people who would sit down for me and know what I was playing. It turns out Nicholas did know what I was playing and had followed my content for quite some time where I had no idea what I was playing against, which can be a significant disadvantage when you're playing the mirror match because in the mirror match, you're basically trying to establish a piece of business as quick as possible. So opening hands that don't have ramp in them are oftentimes not good enough. And my hand, I don't remember exactly what it had, but I know it was a little bit slower having started off with a turn one young wolf. Regardless, I got into a position that game where I was able to establish a Yawgmoth and I had a very important decision to make with a Court of Calling. He had an Agatha's Soul Cauldron in play and at the end of turn, I could choose to cord for two and get myself a Hepatra, which would allow me to draw numerous cards given the board state, or I could go for my main deck Scavenging Ooze, which would protect me from his cauldron if it were to get out of hand. He did have a Grist in play, so my Yogg was likely going to die on the next turn, but I was banking on the fact that I would be able to kill him before it got to that point. So what I did is I went for a Hepatra. Hepatra drew me seven cards. I was at 16 life. I went down to nine life. And I decided I didn't want to go any lower in life uh, to risk him killing me on his following turn. So I passed the turn back uh, after playing out a basic land. I had drawn seven cards, so I had a ton of cards in my hand, one of which was a Blooming Marsh, which I should have played out because that would have been my third land. It was a subtle mistake, but it wound up costing me potentially the game, not catching on to that detail. I discard, I pass the turn back. Nicholas does what I expect him to do. He minuses his Grist. Kills my Yawgmoth, which I don't respond to because I didn't want my life total to go down any lower. He eats the Yawg with the Cauldron, cords for a Blood Artist, and proceeds to kill me a few moments later uh, with Blood Artist triggers. I also missed a Bowmaster trigger over the course of this interaction. It was the only one I missed the entire weekend, I'm pretty sure. And I don't think it would have mattered in this instance, but there were a couple of small mistakes and a judgment call that I made over the course of that game that may have cost me the game Unclear, but Nicholas played very well, so I don't want to take anything away from him. The next game, I open up my seven card hand, and it was excellent. I had Wall of Roots, Wall of Roots, which ramped into a Yawgmoth. I think I had a Young Wolf as well, so I was feeling very good about the way my hand looked. But unfortunately, after I play out my Wall of Roots on turn two, Nicholas proceeds to cast Legion's End, exiles my Wall of Roots in play, and also exiles the other Wall of Roots in my hand. So basically my entire plan was destroyed with that one spell and the rest of the game, I was not able to recover to him two for wanting my mana ramp. Uh, he cast a Yogg and it just got out of control very, very quickly. So he destroyed me, he played very well and Nicholas wound up making the top four as well in this event. So props to Nicholas, congrats to Nicholas and he definitely earned the win against me in that match. So I've suffered my first loss and I don't have any more losses to give if I'm going to make the top eight of this event. Basically have to win out until I can draw in in the last round, potentially. So it's round four and I sit across from Ben and Ben was a young guy who was very enthusiastic and seemed very happy to be at the event. When Ben sat down, he took out his deck box and he also took out the token that was inside of his deck box and placed it on top of the box, which is a treasure token. Now, there are two reasons somebody would do this. One, they're trying to deceive you and make you think that they're playing something they're not playing. Or two, they don't understand that revealing that treasure token provides me with information in terms of what you could be playing. And at this point in modern, there's pretty much three decks that would require a treasure token. Indomitable Creativity, Blue Red Mark Tide, or Scam. And while there are certainly more, those are the three main decks that I would have on my radar when I see that. So what I gathered based on Ben showing me that treasure token and based on the way that he was shuffling his deck, he 
He was looking at his cards very adamantly as he was shuffling his deck the entire time. I deduced that he was probably a newer player and a little bit more casual and didn't necessarily understand how a competitive event worked or functioned or the level of player that was at an event like this. I put Ben on Blue Red Mark Titan and I turned out to be correct. Uh, it was in fact what he was playing. He had a green splash for questing Druid and pick your poison as well. But this was Ben's first competitive event. And if I'm being candid, the match was not close. There were moments where Ben was missing his triggers or he would trigger, but after he resolved the spell, you know, things like uh, the questing druid, getting a plus one, plus one counter, uh, he would do it after he resolved the spell or like he would resolve the spell and then resolve another spell and be like, oh, I forgot my counters. I later found out it was Ben's first competitive event and I could tell that he was very, very new at this. So I was trying to uphold the rules of the game. I didn't want these things to just completely go out the window because I did know that he was missing triggers and that the triggers were not going on the stack at the time they were supposed to go on the stack. But I also, my first big tournament, I had a really bad experience where I had a judge called on me because I did not have the appropriate number of cards in my sideboard. And I got a game loss in my first competitive event. This is a rule that was previously in place that is no longer in place. I had a four card sideboard in my first event. I felt very scared in that moment when the judge got called and I got a game loss. And I also, it didn't leave a very good taste in my mouth about competitive play at the time. So I didn't want Ben to suffer the same feelings that I had when I first started playing competitive magic. I wanted him to come back. I wanted him to want to come back to another competitive event because he had a good experience in the event that he was playing at today. In a very friendly manner, I continued to remind him to remember his triggers when they were supposed to occur. and. After it occurred probably a half a dozen times, I, I advised Ben, I said, Ben, you know, you're doing a good job, but I'm gonna start holding you accountable for your triggers when they're supposed to occur. And he understood and he was like, okay, yeah, I get it, that's fine. He did miss a couple of triggers from that point forward. I actually didn't even have to hold him accountable. He just completely forgot about them, but that's okay. Ultimately, I won the match 2-0. Like I said, it wasn't particularly competitive. After the match, I talked to Ben and I asked him if he wanted a few pointers. So we talked over some etiquette with regards to things you should and shouldn't do at big tournaments. And I also advised him, don't show your opponent your treasure token before the match actually starts. Don't give them that information because they will use that against you. So moving on, we are three and one. Uh, we're back in the win column and it's on to round five where I played against Mason, who was on Azorius Hammer. And this match was a stark contrast to the match prior, not because Mason was, you know, an MTG pro or anything like that, but my match with Ben was very lighthearted and very uh, casual, I'll say. And this match was definitely my most tense match of the day. Game one, I was on the play. I think I was on the play. And I kept an opening seven hand that was fine, but it was not a hand that was particularly good against Hammer. Uh, it had a Bowmaster, it had a Shieldred, but didn't have a way to meaningfully interact with his creatures, especially if it was equipped with a Colossus Hammer. And what wound up happening, I promptly got run over. I think it was a turn three kill. So Mason did me away very quickly in game one, and we are on to game two. Game two was a back and forth affair, but me having the information now of knowing what he was playing allowed me to make better decisions over the course of that game. And eventually I was able to establish Yawgmoth Thrand Physician along with Hepatra Vizier of Poisons, the same combination that I established in round one, which is able to mow down his board, establish a good board of chump blockers, and slowly take over the game. I established control at like one or two life, and he was at like 30 something life because of a Shadow Spear, but my board presence was just way too much for him to deal with at that point, and I, over the course of three or four turns, just beat him down and won the game. That second game took us about 30 minutes to complete. So we're on to game three. We've got about 10 minutes left on the clock. And this is the deciding game. Once again, if either of us lose this game, we're essentially out of top eight contention. So there was a lot riding on us, not only getting this game done, but winning the game as well. So we're a few turns into the game and Mason has double Sigarda's aid in play. And I have a Yogma. He casts a Colossus Hammer and targets a creature, and I activate Yawgmoth in response, and then proliferate to kill his creature. He proceeds to call a judge because he states that because he has two Sigarda's aids in play, his second trigger of the Sigarda's aid will go above my Yawgmoth activation, enabling him to put the hammer on his creature before I'm able to proliferate and kill the creature down. 
I know that this is not how this works. I tried to explain to him that that's not how it works, but he was very adamant uh, that the way he perceived the ruling to occur was actually how the rule existed. The judge promptly explained to him that what he thought was the case was not the case and his creature was going to die. Afterwards, he was very apologetic and he, he realized his mistake, but it was a very tense interaction, a very intense interaction uh, while we were sorting out that judge call. A few moments later, we had a another situation where I had a Yawgmoth and two other creatures in play, and he had a pure steel paladin with a hammer and a shadow spear on it. I was at 12 or 13 life, and I needed to chump block in a way where I stayed alive. So I threw my Yawgmoth and two other creatures in the way to be able to prevent an adequate amount of damage so I didn't die. One of those creatures was a snake token for, from Hepatra, so it would kill the pure steel paladin after damage was dealt. I lined up my blocks and then we went to damage and he proceeded to say, you're dead. And I looked at him very confused. I said, no, this is more than enough to soak up all of the damage that you're dealing. I think it was seven points of blockers against his 13 points of attack. And once again, he was very adamant. He said, you're dead. Uh, and we were forced to call another judge over. And he was basically arguing that because Yawgmoth has protection from humans and pure steel paladin was a human, that the Paladin could not assign damage to the Yawgmoth, and therefore I would take the four damage that the Yawg was supposed to soak up over the course of these blocks. Wasn't how it worked. His Paladin died, I stayed alive, and wound up just turning my creature sideways for the rest of the game and winning via a beatdown strategy. So now I'm four and one. I was very tense after that match. We went to turns, it was very stressful. Mason was a good guy. He admitted his mistakes after the judges explained to him how the interactions work. But the match was very tense and it left me feeling a little bit drained after those interactions. So my next match, fortunately, was much more lighthearted. It was round six against Kenny. Uh, and at the beginning of the match, Kenny reveals a Gigantha. So right off the bat, I am thinking Domain Zoo. Kenny was a very funny guy, but he looked a little distressed when we sat down across from each other and had proceeded to tell me initially when we sat down and we we're just chatting, getting to know each other that he was, he was pretty tired. He had just taken more of his medication. He was a little disoriented. He, he was having some issues, it seemed. This became more apparent when we started playing. Kenny had a turn zero play, which is the ley line of the guild pack, and followed that up with a Neshoba Brawler and then a Territorial Kabu. The only problem was Kenny tapped out to make these plays and had fetch lands in play. He didn't actually fetch to get lands to protect himself if I was able to remove his ley line of the guild pack. So me seeing that was exactly what I did. I wound up using my Court of Calling to get my Haywire Might. I exiled the guild pack. And as a result of that, he had no basic land types in play and his Kabu went to the graveyard due to his state-based action. So I was able to get a two for one off of that. And because of that, the following turn, I was at a high enough life total. That I was able to get Yogg in play along with another creature and mow down his Neshoba Brawler. And then the game was essentially over at that point. He couldn't recover from my card advantage and the disadvantage that I had put him into. Game two was also a little bit of a landslide. He did not have the Leyline Scion combo. I had a bunch of my sideboard cards, including Pick Your Poison, Fatal Push. I had a Besaju, and I also had a Shieldred's Edict. Uh, I killed all of his creatures very promptly, had a good board state, eventually got Yogg into play, and it was over pretty quickly. Got the win. I'm now five and one. So it's round seven and I am back up towards the top tables. I see my round one opponent sitting diagonally across from me. It appears Owen has been winning as well. I'm sitting across from a gentleman who I had seen playing the day prior. Uh, his name was Scott. Scott, I knew was playing Yogmo. So as opposed to my match earlier in the day where I did not know I was facing the mirror match, Scott, I knew I was facing the mirror match. What I also knew, I had seen Scott playing the mirror match the day prior, so I had an idea of how he was going to be sideboarding against me. I had also seen him execute a walking ballista combo from his deck, which was an important piece of information for me to know so I could play around it over the course of our match. Game one, we wound up finding ourselves in a situation where we both had established Yawgmoth in play and we both had Agatha's Soul Cauldron in play. The only problem for Scott is that my board was significantly wider. I had double Young Wolf, and I could put him into a position where I forced him to activate his cauldron so I couldn't combo because I can sacrifice a young wolf. And if he doesn't do anything, I can just draw as many cards as I want. So me knowing that, I put him in a position where he had to activate his cauldron to eat my young wolf. And then I was able to stick a young wolf and a strangle root geist 
and I just drew as many cards as I wanted until I found a Court of Calling, courted for a Blood Artist, and killed him. Game 1 went on for a while, but Game 2 was actually a fairly quick game. I simply overpowered him with card advantage. Once again, the combination of Yaw, Gwanth, and Undying Creatures. If you get that out early in the matchup and the opponent doesn't have an answer for that, you can end the game very quickly, and that was exactly what I did. Overall, this match wasn't particularly eventful. There wasn't a lot of high-level interaction. It was just my hands were good, I got what I needed, and I put him in a position where he was forced to make a move, and then I had the other pieces to close out the game. Moved on to 6-1, and one, and now I am playing a win and in or what I think is a win and in for top 8 in round 8. I sit down across from Victor, and I had seen Victor earlier in the weekend. I did not know what Victor was playing, but I thought he might be on Domain Zoo. But with that being said, Victor did not reveal a Gigantha. So I thought one of two things in that moment. Either Victor forgot to reveal his companion, or he wasn't playing Domain Zoo. He starts off with a fetch land and gets a Triome, one that you would see in Domain Zoo, and I'm a little perplexed. But eventually what becomes apparent to me is he is in fact playing Domain Zoo, but he has a sideboard card that's preventing him from playing Gigantha as his companion. We get in a situation this game where it is very, very close. He has a board of Scion of Draco, Territorial Kavu, and Wild Nakadal. I have two Young Wolves, a Wall of Roots, and a Hapatra. His Scion of Draco has a minus one, minus one counter from a previous Yawgmoth that he had used a Leyline Binding on to get rid of. I was at one life, and what I wound up having to do was Court Calling to get my Haywire Might, exile his Leyline Binding to get my Yawg back, which put me back up to three life. I then was able to sacrifice a Young Wolf and a Snake to put his Scion down to a 1-1, one, one, and then I proliferated it to kill it so I would stay alive. At that point, my board was so wide with snakes and my wolves were three threes at that point. His Kavu also had minus one, minus one counters on it. So it was a three three, I think at this point as well. And I had essentially locked up the board. He wasn't getting through unless he drew another Scion, but I was at one life. So if he found a burn spell, I would have just died instantly if he drew one off the top. We went back and forth like four or five turns and I got very, very lucky. He did not find a burn spell at any point and I was able to top deck a Shieldred or a Court of Calling, but I found Shieldred basically at some point and started gaining life. And then once Shieldred was in play and he didn't find a burn spell on that following turn, I gained life off the draw step and then I can go infant from that point, put myself out of harm's way and just win the game. And that is what I did. So I wound up winning game one. Game two, if I'm being honest, was a complete blowout. He did have Leyline of the Guild Pack. He also had Leyline of the Void, which is why Gigantha was not in his sideboard. Uh, I wound up having Force of Vigor to get rid of both of those. And the rest of his hand was very reactive and it wasn't enough to keep me at bay. And the game was quickly ended as a result of me just generating card advantage with Grist and Yogg, and it was, it was not even close. So I was up to seven and one. And at this point, I think I was in sixth place. My breakers were good, not great. And I got paired into my round nine opponent, Connor. I didn't know what Connor was playing, but he came and he approached me and he said, you know, here are the standings. This is how it breaks out. Uh, there's likely going to be one X11 one, one that doesn't make it, but I think both of our breakers are good enough that we should be able to draw into the top eight. When it comes to breakers, I don't completely understand how the math works. I don't pretend to know. It's not really my expertise, but for whatever reason in the moment, I trusted Connor and I was like, all right, Let's draw. Let's see how this thing plays out. So we drew, and I was very fortunate that I wound up getting into the top eight as the seven seed. And the funny thing, the interesting thing about this, is that in the event I won last year, the Gathering 10K, I was also the seven seed. The Star City event I won in 2019, I was also the seven seed. The Star City event I won back in 2016, I was also the seven seed. So to me, I took that as a good omen. I'm going to win this thing. I'm on to the top eight. As is the case in the top eight, you, you know who you're playing against. So as a seven seed, I knew I was playing against the two seed, who just so happened to be Drew, who I played in the finals of the Gathering 10K last year. I've gotten to know Drew since then. When I played him in the finals of that previous event, he was on Merktide, and I put such a beating on him that he wound up switching over to Yawgmoth as a result of that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but he was playing Yawgmoth, and he has been playing Yawgmoth over the last couple of months. The great thing is that I've been playing this deck for so long that even against really good players, I still feel advantaged because I have so many reps and I have such a good comprehension of what I need to do in every matchup. Even the mirror match, I have something like a 75 or 80% win rate in the mirror. 
The only downside was because I was the lower seed, I was going to be on the draw. So I was going to need to steal a game on the draw at some point in order to win this match and walk away uh, into the top four. Fortunately, my game one hand was like the perfect hand for the mirror match. It was all gas. It was ramp creatures. It was young wolves. It was Yogmon. Even if Andrew had a decent hand, it was still not good enough. Like it just didn't, didn't really matter what he had. My hand was just so good. I just completely outclassed him, had a turn three Yogmoth, and I easily won that game. There really wasn't anything he could have done to stop what I was doing. Game two, my hand was also really, really strong. And his only chance to stop me was Agatha's Soul Cauldron, which he had in play. I had a Yogmoth, I had a Young Wolf. He had a Grist in his graveyard. There was also a Grist in my graveyard. He knew I had Surgical Extraction in my hand because he had Legions ended one of my creatures earlier that game. It was the end of my turn. He activated his Soul Cauldron. He was targeting my Grist in the graveyard. And I had a choice to make in that moment where I could have surgical my own Grist to prevent him from taking that ability and putting on one of his own creatures. But had I done that, he would have just targeted his own Grist, which was in the graveyard the next turn, and he would have gotten that benefit. So instead what I did is I let him eat my Grist and I let him choose his target for the Cauldron. And in response to the target, I put a minus one, minus one counter on the creature with Yogma. What that did is when the plus one, plus one counter went onto that creature, they canceled out. So he didn't actually have a plus one, plus one counter on the creature, and he wouldn't be able to activate Grist's ability on that creature with the cauldron. Every time he tried to activate the cauldron to put an ability on a creature, I would do that interaction. So he never actually got to use the cauldron. And as a result of that, I just completely dominated the game. It really wasn't close. So Drew was gracious in defeat. He wished me good luck in the top four and then left the convention center. And I sit down in the top four against who was supposed to be my round nine opponent, Connor. And once again, I had no idea what Connor was playing. Before every match, I sit down and I count my deck. I do a pile shuffle. And the purpose of that is for me to know that there's 60 part cards in my deck. And I pile shuffled. And at this point, it's like 10 o'clock at night. It's pretty late. I pile shuffle my deck and I count 58 cards. And I look through my sideboard. I look through my deck box just to make sure I didn't forget two cards somewhere. I can't find two cards anywhere. So I pile shuffle again and I come out to 58 cards once more. I'm like, okay, something's wrong. I'm missing two cards. And then I realize that when I was playing against Drew, his cauldron ate my wrist and ate my wall of roots. And what must have happened is he took my cards and put them into his deck box when he left. So we had to pause our top four match before we started and get Drew, who had left about 10 minutes ago at that point, to come back to bring my cards back. And sure enough, he did have them in his deck box, but it was a little stressful and pretty funny in that moment that that had happened. I got my cards, I shuffle up, and now we're ready to go. So I'm sitting across from Connor. Once again, I don't know what he's playing. I can't remember if I was on the play or the draw. It's unclear. But I keep an opening seven, which is fine. But had I known what he was playing, I in no way would have kept my hand. Turns out he was on basically Pioneer Mono Green Ramp with Karn, which is no longer legal in Pioneer, and the One Ring. And fortunately for me, while I don't play Pioneer, and I in no way have a deep understanding of the decks that are in that format, I had made a YouTube video about a week and a half or two weeks earlier playing a mono green ramp deck. So I actually knew to an extent what his deck was doing and how it was trying to do that. I had actually read a primer by Bobby Fortinelli on mono green devotion when I was filming that video so I would understand how the combo within that deck worked. So I knew when I was playing against Connor the amount of mana that he would require to be able to kill me with the combo. So I had that on my radar and I, I, I was aware of that aspect of his deck. But anyway, game one, I kept an opening seven hand. I didn't know what he was playing. What wound up happening is he did eventually combo kill me. It took him a couple of tries because I was keeping up endurance to be able to play around him going for that line. But what it came down to is my opening seven was just not strong enough to contest with what he was doing. When I moved on to sideboarding, I didn't have a sideboard plan for this deck. I wasn't expecting to face mono green ramp. And Connor and I we were kind of joking around about it. I was looking at my sideboard guide. I was looking at my Tron matchup and my Amulet matchup to kind of get some context in terms of what I wanted to bring in, what I wanted to take out. And he was joking. He was saying like, oh, do you have my deck on your sideboard guide? And, you know, I said no. And then he followed up with something to the effect of, oh, you know, if I beat you, will you put it on there? And, you know, we were, we were talking smack back and forth. It was a really fun match. And I said, no, no chance. I bored into a configuration that was kind of like a hybrid of playing against amulet and tron shuffle them up 
and I draw my opening seven, and my seven is a hand that's really aggressive, but didn't have any business. It was like double Bowmaster, Strangle Root Geist, and some ramp. And against Tron, those hands are actually not terrible. They can get there. And with him having the one rings, it could potentially shut off hit that angle of attack for him. He might not be able to utilize them to their full ability. So I decided to keep the hand, and it turned out that that was exactly how the game played out. I got him down to something like four life by just attacking. And he wound up stabilizing with a ring, but he couldn't leverage it to the fullest ability because if he activated it, my two Bowmasters in play would just kill him. Eventually, he, he got an Ensnaring Bridge in play, but he couldn't activate his ring, so he's taking one damage every turn off of that. I eventually got rid of his Ensnaring Bridge and just attacked in for lethal, and we were on to game three. So game three was very intense, and this whole match was very intense, even though we were having fun and we were talking smack to each other. Uh, this was probably my hardest match all day. Connor had a very domineering board. He had a land that was producing about six mana, a Kiora, a Garrick, and a Ring in play. I had a pretty good board state as well, but I had to pass the turn. And on his turn, he essentially could go off if he sequenced his, his moves properly. I was counting on him making a mistake, and that I knew that if he activated his Ring before he activated his Garrick, I would be able to flash in my Bowmaster kill his Garrick, and he probably wasn't going to be able to kill me that turn. Connor is a really good player, and he played really well our entire match, but it was late, it was a long day, we had both played a couple of days worth of Magic, and I got lucky in that he, in that moment, missequenced his activations and activated the ring before he had activated Garrick. I flashed in the Bowmaster, killed the Garrick before he had the opportunity to use it, and that wound up being the difference between me making the finals and him making the finals. So now it's super late and I'm on to the finals and my finals opponent is Ryan Bellamy playing four color Omnath. And I was praying that Ryan would not win his match, not because I don't like Ryan, but because typically this matchup is super grindy, takes a long time. And I was just hungry and tired. I just wanted to get to sleep. But Ryan was a very good player and wound up winning his match against my round three Yawgmoth opponent, Nicholas, who was my only loss on the day. So even though I feel very confident in the matchup, I felt like I had maybe a little bit of an uphill battle ahead of me just because Ryan knew what I was playing and it had just beat the same matchup. But my fears were not realized because once again, I had a really, really strong hand. Game one, I, I pretty much had the ideal draw. I had a turn four Yogg with double Young Wolf. And when I had that and he was tapped out, I can just draw as many cards as I want from that position. He saw that and he just scooped it up. In game two, I also had a very strong hand. He had a turn for Omnath, which I was able to instantly kill with a Grist Minus, which was valuable because he wasn't able to gain any life. I proceeded to beat him down over the next couple of turns and got him down to a lowly six life with, I think, two insects, maybe a Yawgmoth and a Halfling. And I still had my Grist in play from earlier in the game. Grist was at five loyalty. And I also had an untapped fetch land. Ryan proceeded to cast Supreme Verdict on his turn, for which I responded to, got my Dryad Arbor, sacked all my creatures, put them all into the graveyard, Verdict resolved, put my Yawgmoth into the graveyard. I untapped and ultimated my Grist for six, which was his exact life total, and I wound up winning the tournament. I finished 10-1-1, walked away with my first SCG trophy, which I am very, very happy about. This was the, the only thing I really wanted, I was really concerned about all weekend. I wanted this, I don't care about the RC invite. Money is nice, but I wanted a trophy. That's, that's why I show up to these things. So the trophy was nice, not only because one of my big goals for the weekend, but because the other two Star City events that I won, uh, I won plaques, which you might be able to see in the background, but I wanted, I wanted a trophy. I was thrilled to have walked away the champion and while I had initially had plans of playing in all three events that weekend, the 5k on Friday, the 10k on Saturday, the 10k on Sunday, it was like 11 p.m. I hadn't eaten dinner. I was exhausted. I just wanted to go to sleep. And I had decided that I wasn't going to play in the event the next day, despite initially setting out to win all three events over the course of the three days. I fell short of my goal, but ultimately I still had a crazy successful weekend. You can never be bad. Uh, winning a tournament, and I am very, very grateful for being able to do that. As was the case back in the day, we used to give props and slops at the end of every tournament report, so that's what I'm going to do now to close things out. My props for the weekend, first and foremost, all of the people I met over the course of the weekend, uh, all of my patrons, all of my YouTube subscribers, and just random people 
I met some really, really cool people and I am grateful to, you know, have a bunch of new friends and to have rekindled or been able to revisit old friendships that I had had in the past. So it was really nice. This was my first Star City events in 2019. So a lot of these people I hadn't seen for five or six years. So it was really, really cool to be able to, to meet up with old friends once again, even though because the events ran so late each night, I didn't really get the chance to hang out with people the way I would have liked to. It was still really nice to see everybody. Props, once again, to trophies. I'm a big fan of trophies. The, uh, the Gathering 10K that I won last year, uh, I did not get a trophy for that. I was very disappointed about that. So the Gathering Place, if you're watching this, if you're gonna do the event again this year, make a trophy. That's a big appeal. My last prop, but not least, this guy, the good doctor, Dr. Yogmoth. This deck is so incredible, not only because it's a blast to play, but I honestly feel that every single match there is an opportunity to win as long as your deck just doesn't feed you a bunch of garbage. If you get reasonable hands, you can find a way to win every matchup. And that's why I set the goal as high as I did this weekend. And that's why I'm so confident in my ability to win with this deck. There is always a way or always something you can do different. And I, sometimes I feel like I just, I just can't be beaten when I'm playing this deck. Now we're going to move on to the slops, things that weren't so great. First and foremost, Atlanta drivers, you're crazy. Stop at red lights, stop at stop signs, don't kill anybody. Second, the second slop was the Georgia Congress, whatever it was called, center, the convention center that we were in. Well, the place was relatively clean. It was unnecessarily large and was a maze to try to navigate through. It provoked a lot of unnecessary anxiety trying to get to events on time and try to navigate my way out of that place at the end of the night, walking what felt like for miles to find where my car was. Not only that, I brought my own food and they did not have a single microwave in the convention hall to be able to heat up my food, nor was there a water fill station. I had to use the water fountain, which my water bottle would not fit under, which was a little annoying over the course of the weekend. There was that. Additionally, for slops, convention center food, terrible as always, pizza and hot dogs, we can do better than that, right? We can, we can provide people with maybe some healthier options to help them function or perform at a higher level when they're playing a very mentally and physically intensive game. I don't want pizza and hot dogs when I'm trying to perform at my best over the course of two days. My second to last slop, uh, this event I had thought was for a modern RC invite, but it turns out I was terribly wrong. Once again, it was for a pioneer invite, which I am not particularly thrilled about. This time around, might actually try to qualify through the Pioneer RC. Last time I just didn't show up. This time I'm debating whether or not I learn Amalia combo and give it a try. And last but not least, my final slop of this event was me not winning all three events. I know it's crazy. I am grateful, very, very grateful and humbled to have won the event that I won, but I really wanted to do something that hadn't been done before. I wanted to win all three. And I'm going to continue to try to reach that goal. If I do play in another event at a later time, I know I'm capable and uh, I think I'm going to get that goal at some point. So keep an eye out for me because I'm coming for you. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. I will see you all again very soon. Thank you for the support, the love. I'm grateful for all of it. Grateful to walk away the champ. And uh, until next time, you know the deal. Be well, my friends. <laughs>